All right. I am really stoked to uh, we're having on today. It's Paul Stanford. Uh, if you don't know him, you should. He's up there for me with the people like Vivian McPeak, uh, John Sinclair, Jack Herrer, uh, known as Terror. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's talk. What's up, Paul? Oh, it's a nice, sunny, but very cold February day here in Portland, Oregon. How are you? Good. It's supposed to hit 20 degrees tomorrow here in Seattle. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think we're going to be at 19 tonight, they say. Man, I'm not looking forward to this, but at least we're not we're not going to be hit with a lot of snow. How about you guys? Yeah, I don't think uh, there's there's no snow currently in the forecast, but you just never know after these cold waves. Yeah, you, you just don't know, and, and hopefully the moisture stays out. But uh, let's talk about you, man. I'm really excited. So, like, I really Thanks first thank you taking the time, dude. Like, you know, when I first, we last met, uh, I think I was down there for, it was, like, obviously pre-pandemic, but I think your last Hempstock, and I think we went yeah. to, uh, 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 like, an after, like, hangout uh, some place. I think it's your, t- your, your, um, your, 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 uh, was the headquarters? I guess my office, office, which is where I'm at right yeah. now. Here, somebody came in and about two, two and a half years ago, donated uh, this painting uh, behind me. A pretty well-known graffiti artist. All oh, right, on. Yeah, man. You so you you've been around for a long time, and I don't think people understand the significance. You know, when I talk about legalization, it's not about like a one-person deal. You know, you know, not one person made a big effort or did it. You know, but uh, you made a huge impact people lots of us for a long long time so when i first did my first marijuana legalization action i had heard about the washington smoke in in washington dc at that time i lived in Asheville, north carolina in 1978 wow. which is what about 44 years ago now and so uh i uh went to or is it that long no, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, 40, 43, that's it. But uh, I went and I met a number of some of my mentors at the time. And, and throughout my life, I, I got to meet Dana Beal there, who uh, is one of the Yippie founders. And Dr. Todd McCurria was there. He uh, uh, helped establish medical marijuana in California and uh, was at- under attack by the Clinton administration at the time. Uh, well, you, and, uh, okay, sorry. No, that's okay. I was just saying, like, you, you, you've helped, like, first off, you have a Wikipedia, which I think is pretty fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. There's been some, some people that have battled over it. There's been a Wikipedia war between various factions out there on Wikipedia, the... The forces of evil wanted to put bad stuff in there, and some of my friends tried to counter it. I think they froze it for a while. Yeah, but I, well, I don't even look at it because uh, I just don't look at it. It's not bad, really. I I, I looked at it before we talked because you know, like I know only so much about you. I know you from Hempstock. I know you uh, uh, helped Jack Hare, uh, uh you know, do uh, information for Emperor and wears those clothes. Yeah. So, I mean, you've fundamentally been around for a long time, and especially in uh, Oregon, where you know, you you have the Cannabis Common Sense show, which you well on YouTube uh, is so crazy. I love it, I, 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 and I love that you've been doing this through community. Uh, uh, like you're you're a community theater person, right? Community. Yeah, cable access television. Cable access. <laughs> so yeah, we uh, started in October of 1996 on cable access, and so I'm still doing it. So over 25 years now. 96, man. So like. Uh, you have 15, I mean, YouTube's been around for only a little bit, so, but you have 15 oh. years worth of uh, uh, content. YouTube wasn't there then. Yeah. <laughs> but are you, are you, uh, the videos that you have uploaded, are they all your, uh, they're not everything, are they? No, the, the first about 300 shows were not there. The first 300, we started putting them on our own video server. Uh, back then, you get like one frame every two seconds, but you know, it's mainly the sound that counts. It's 99% of the information comes through the sound. But uh, uh, we started doing them on uh, Mark Emery's Pot TV for a while. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we took our, and then uh, we moved to YouTube when it came around just because it was economically inexpensive. And uh, 
Uh, it's good. So I think we have, I don't know, about seven or 800 shows on YouTube, but who can watch seven or 800 hours? But we've had everybody <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, cannabis i think or just about everybody from jack Hare to keith strop on the show mm -hmm. over the years and yeah and I, not okay sorry no i first met jack in uh 1982 in los angeles i went down to los angeles during a break from my uh summer studies i'd taken summer semester at evergreen state college but i still had about six week break so i went down to la initially trying to get on trivia game shows because I'm, I'm quite <laughs> trivial. I can answer those little trivia questions. But uh, uh, after staying for a couple of days, uh, I looked in Yippie's newspaper, which is called Overthrow, and there was this thing that said Reefer Raiders. So I went and I met Captain Ed Adair at his uh, Heads and High shop. Wow. And uh, I stayed there for about two weeks in the back of his uh, – head shop as I worked for Tom Hayden, who was one of the Chicago seven. I got a job uh, uh, registering voters in front of the Santa Monica DMV. So I made a little bit of money while I was there. And uh, then I met Jack just as I was leaving. Ed Adair said, you got to meet my partner, Jack. So I drove about a mile just off of Van Nuys Boulevard and went to his store, High Country. And that's where I met Jack. And he gave me a copy of his first book which is about uh rating cannabis on a scale of one to ten it's a, a coloring book and so uh no kidding yeah yeah and i so never I, heard of it yeah if you buy there's a box set of jack stuff out there if you can get one of those box sets it includes the the first comic book and uh uh wow. the video that uh was made about him the hour-long documentary funded by Anita Roderick at the, the body shop. But uh, Jack uh, and I worked petitioning. In fact, he moved to Oregon in 1984. He moved from California and mm. I moved from Washington state in 1984. And I've been in Oregon ever since he moved away about 1989 or so, maybe well, 88. Didn't he tour a lot in his later years? It was following like the, uh, the festival circuit with the. He Sony created the festival circuit really. Mm. He, and uh, Debbie Goldsberry and Maria Sawitz, uh, they uh, started the hip tour and went oh, campus shit. to campus selling Jack's book. But Jack had a history taking magazine crews city to city selling magazine subscriptions. So it was kind of an extension of what he had done before he got into the head shop business. That's crazy. I didn't know that. I know. I mean, I knew he was in the army. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the magazine thing when I was young and dumb and, and, you know, now it's a kind of a scam where it's like, you'd walk around and tell people like, Oh, it's for my college tuition. And it really yeah. wasn't, it was just a group of uh, gypsies that would traveled around and right. Right. You know? That's kind of what he did. I, I, uh, never took the job, but I did apply for it once or twice as they came through North Carolina when I was a teenager. Oh my goodness. And it, you know, what's funny. I mean, it was cool. But it was not something that was going to, you know, pay bills and be life sustaining. <laughs> no, no. You'd have some pocket money. That was about it. Yeah, but Jack sure. had that experience. And then he started doing that with his own book. Uh, oh, shit. And created what they called the Hemp Tour. That was about 88 or 89. And uh, right when he first. Uh, uh, and, and, and pipes, too, right? He was selling books and pipes, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Damn, that, it's just interesting. I think you have so much like a plethora of knowledge, like your show, your your personal history. You know, I know people look at me and say I do, but I, there's so much more before us. You know, like yeah. uh, I, I like I, like for instance, the reason why when we first when we last when we last hanged out, you know, I was just uh, me and Tom, my 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 co-host for this podcast that we go through or we do. It started as a Google Hangouts. Like like I like to talk about weed personally. I just want to you know move the for conversation forward all the other stuff, you know, but it's also a very depressing topic for the most part. Prohibition overall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've know? been reading news stories for 25 years, but I first started posting hip news stories online in 1988. And yeah. then back then, that was before the web. The web didn't come around. The the graphical user interface or video, if you want to call it that, yeah. didn't come around until about 94. But for the first five or six years, there were these Usenet news groups 
that mm. were like a bulletin board and you would tack your stuff up there under various topics and alt.hip was one uh a whole bunch of different things there were a whole bunch of different bulletin boards and i would post uh well first of all i started i got a little CompuServe 64 computer in the mid 80s oh, and uh I got online through CompuServe. And back then, CompuServe charged you $6 an hour to be online. Man. And there was a service called the Executive News Service. And I put in keywords like marijuana, hemp, uh, and I'd get these news articles. Now, while I was logged into that, they charged me an extra $12 an hour. So I was paying $18 an hour for it. So I was reading it thinking nobody else knows his stuff almost all the stories were drug busts and drugs you know yes all that, until you know about 12 or 15 years ago but uh i realized no one else is seeing this and so i started taking it and posting it to these used net news groups and so they're still out there and those posts are still available for people who want to scroll through used net news groups i think it's amazing how like tech like has been a part of cannabis legalization for a long time. Like, like for we dominated reason, online. We still do. Yeah. But we've always dominated heavily online, like nine to one in terms of legalizing cannabis. Well, I, I joke that because I work in tech, but if you're a piss test, any tech building, whatever, uh, you guarantee to lose a lot of employees, right? Like there's this yeah. weird bullshit. Um, uh, like the, you know, smoking cannabis is going to make you stupid, make you lazy. But yet, you know, can tech and cannabis kind of have gone hand in hand as far as like, like Stephen Hager. He was one of the first ones to stream a uh, 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 high times cup. You know, that's like was yeah. mind blowing pay-per-view online. You could stream it. And uh, uh, I think that was early 92. I'm not sure. But it was still one of the first ones. And then you with the uh, uh, taking on a local cable television channel like what what inspired you to do that like like out of out of pocket to like just say okay we're gonna meet every week or whatever schedule you decided man yeah well i had been on other people's cable television shows uh a number of times you know and every time i was on these other shows our phones would ring off the hook and so in 1996 there's a fellow named Lanny Swerdlow, who was an activist still in Southern California. Lanny Swerdlow was already doing four cable access television shows himself. Three were focused around LGBTQ2, LGBTQT uh, community. And one was about atheism. And so he came and he asked me if I would, uh, if he, I would host a show about marijuana because he'd seen me on these other cable shows. And I said, yeah, but I had had several people say, you should get your own show. You should get your own show. And so back then, cable was much more popular. And so uh, yeah. we started, he filmed the first 120 episodes in his own studios. So then in 1999, he moved back to Southern California. And I had met some other people who... Uh, who'd seen the TV show and they didn't want it to go away. So we all went to the cable access studio where we were already a, a series there and went through their classes and jumped through their hoops and qualified to use their studios. And we've been doing it ever since. Man. So almost fuck, 30 years. Yeah. We started in October of 96. So we're Man. like 25 and a half years right now that we've been doing a weekly cable show. The first uh, 120 shows in the private studio, we would go in and do four or five shows once a month. But uh, since show about 120, we've been doing them on a weekly basis. So, and since so the pandemic has closed our studio, hopefully it'll reopen soon. Uh, we're now recording at any time and uh, just posting it for the streaming time. But the they, Portland has four very nice cable access television studios throughout the metropolitan area that they always upgrade. It's funded by cable fees. And most of those cable fees go to government, uh, like city hall and, and the state legislature and county council and streaming that. But they set some aside for these cable 
access television studios and they've upgraded from analog to digital and every year or two they upgrade the facilities it's pretty nice that's pretty awesome that uh oregon does you know this is this is oh man there's so much we need to talk about so like yeah i think it's great that portland does like community service like that right but uh you are like the primary funder for hempstock that's been going on for how many years that went on for how many years uh, from uh, 2005 through 2016. We did the last one in 2016 because of this corporate takeover. I, I know we're going to get to a little bit later. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't afford it. And we had some big debt at the end of the 2016 one. In fact, we just last month paid off $20,000 in uh, uh, security company fees that we had so we Damn. finally got some of that retired just in january but yeah. uh i would spend about 80 to a hundred thousand dollars the last few years and about a third of that came out of my pocket uh two-thirds came from uh booth fees and sponsorships mm. oh sure and was, i was sponsoring it as uh on behalf of my medical clinics and so yeah. uh Starting in 1998, I had a fellow by the name of Dr. Philip Levesque come on my show. We met during taping of a, a local network or, or uh, network affiliate show called Town Hall. And so uh, he came on the show in 98 when medical marijuana law became legal in 1999 here in Oregon. Yeah. May 1st of 1999. People started showing up at our TV studio to have him fill out the medical marijuana paperwork. No and, way. Yeah. And soon they started to overwhelm us. And uh, I didn't want it to cause any problem. The people at the cable access studio were very supportive. You know, they make copies for us and things. But I was afraid oh it God. would hurt our our show. So we moved out and went into some temporary facilities and then opened our own office in uh, 2002. We actually outgrew that office the day we opened there, too. And so uh, we had people coming from Washington state. So soon I advertised in the Washington medical marijuana. I mean, the Washington Mar uh, medical associations monthly newsletter. And I got another doctor to see patients in Washington. And that was in, Oh, I think it was about 2001. And then in 2002, Medical marijuana become legal in Hawaii, and I had some history in Hawaii. So we opened in Hawaii. Then in 2003, we opened in Colorado. And pretty soon, we had offices in a total of nine states. And over the years, I've worked with about 45 different doctors in 60 different cities and have helped 270,000 Americans get their medical marijuana permit in their state so they could legally possess, use, and grow medical marijuana. I like how you call it a permit, not a script. You know, people very under the impression they're getting a prescription. I mean, it's a generic slang street term, yeah. but it's, it's a not a prescription. You can't go in the pharmacy and fill it. That's what you do with a prescription. No, it's a state permit through here in Oregon. It's the uh, health division. And uh, uh, in uh, Hawaii, it's the, the local narcotics office. So it all depends on what state you're in. But most of them, it's through the public health division. It's so cool that to hear your story, how you with the with the community the show, and then the evolution of how you became with the because I was always wondered the chicken and egg thing that did, did Paul have the channel first or did he you know like so it kind of organically grew like you saw a business opportunity uh, like a lot of people did and, and got successful at it you know uh, that's one of the things why I uh, promote like the end of prohibition because you know really it inhibits like success of americans and, and 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 just individuals and you had this opportunity this great thing that you saw you got started and then like you said we're going to talk about the business side of things and then this is something i just blows my mind like when i heard about it and the process of it because you you know let's, let's just be real that you were doing quite well and just everything was good for for a minute and then you had investments oh, yeah. for you years yeah you know we were sponsoring the seattle hemp fest as well mm. uh, the last couple of years we we gave him fifty thousand dollars a year to to help keep that going that's a huge enterprise it it's spiked up to about eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year when they had five stages well that's the uh, thing i know when uh you you were able you had to pull out because again nobody be 
grudges you. We all thank you for all your support and what you've given to us because Hempstock was amazing. And that's what I'm going to talk about, too. Another thing about, like, because the public community service and how Portland, Oregon, people think the Northwest is like this hippy-dippy uh, future uh, of greatness because of, like, the mile and a half hemp fest, right, where you can just smoke all you want. Uh, but You couldn't at first. People <laughs> used to get busted at the hemp fest back in – the early 2000s and uh, no kidding in the 90s. Yeah. People would get busted up until the, yeah, the early to mid 2000s. Uh, when wow. it first started back in, in the 90s, uh, the police would, would bust a lot of people. Were they tickets or were they actually being taken to they, like they uh, take them away and put them in a, they had these uh, vans that they'd process them through. Uh, they never caught wow. me. So I'm not a hundred percent certain exactly what happened, but I think they were, it, no, it was definitely they were taken to jail because they didn't have uh, uh, decriminalization in Washington state. Uh, so it was a, a, a misdemeanor to have simple possession. So they were taken to jail and booked that's, and released and all of that. Fuck, that's so crazy. You know, what's funny is Hamfest. I was uh, in the Navy uh, in the early days of Hamfest. I was actually stationed in Whidbey Island. So oh. I didn't know this great party was happening <laughs> 60 miles south of me. Uh you know, because before I joined the military, uh, I had hair and uh, I did things like gather signatures for Prop 215 and donated okay. early high times. And, you know, I had, you know, my fanboy names were like Stephen Hager, like the, the editorial in the High Times magazine when it was good. You know, now it's whatever yeah. it is. But, uh, um, you know, that's the great thing about the cannabis cause is you can tell a lot of people who come out of a pocket or, or do things on their own time because it's. This is one of the most egregious and wrong things, I think, in America that, you know, once we go forward and it also enables a lot of bad conduct, right, between policing uh, or whether it be uh, uh, the law itself. But yeah. also, like, what happened to Still you? Going on. The yeah. police, uh, almost every time I've been an expert witness in marijuana cases, and I have been in a few, uh, the police have harvested at the at at right just at flower time. And so they know when you're about to harvest, they come in and harvest. And when I look in the evidence locker, all that's left are, are stems and leaves. All the flowers have been uh, trimmed off. And Damn. so uh, that's uh, still the case today. And when they come in, they will take it for their own profit. And then, you know, they're motivated by how much money you've got, too. You know, if you own your house or you have assets, they'll still go after you if they can. Well, that's the thing about prohibition is it has not helped anybody, but it's also punished people for being successful. You know, yeah. Lance Glore had several shops out here, um, and, and and when they caught up with him, I mean, he had storefronts. Like you didn't yeah. really break the case, buddy. <laughs> like I watched the trial happen, and uh, the, the the semantics that happened was like, wow, this is really what you pride yourself on as far as like stopping crime and helping America or your fellow man. Yeah. Like it was such a bullshit um, trial with nothing but cannabis presented as evidence. And then the process that the, the DEA had to get behind a door, it wasn't like they, they had to break in or do a secret handshake. He had to get his permit. He had, a, he, he was denied access first once told, Hey, go with medical, you know, and that's a funny thing is they, during, you know, medical, when medical is predominant uh, law, law of the land, uh, you know, there's a very people look at the medical people as shady still when they shouldn't be. It's just another, you know, they don't look at the Viagra people as like, you know, skeptical or having, you know, negativity of with their industry. You know, yeah. cannabis is a, I had a lot of doctors I work with were amazed when they first started at how sick the patients coming through our door were. They were much sicker than people going through the ER are going into the other doctors yes. offices. So it definitely, uh, generates a lot of compassion and i've been blessed to be able to help so many people uh who are sick and dying uh in in so many ways so it's a blessing for me too and in addition to them no it's truly a healing plant and that's the thing is like you know as a young man when i got into like fighting and yelling and screaming for this plant it had to do with everything about not going to jail you know i mean that's like pretty much it i just want to be a citizen who consumes and goes to the job and does whatever nine to five and you know pay my taxes and be a just productive citizen, but that was never allowed or given it a chance, you know, and it took years for us just to even get where we're at now. Yeah. But like, it was always about money and power. It was never yes. about drugs, 
drugs were a smoke screen. Uh, you know, it, it was about the, as the, one of my mentors uh, that I met back in that 78 smoke in Gatewood Galbraith of Kentucky says it was the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate elite, <laughs> fascist sons of a bitches who brought us marijuana prohibition. Once he passed away about 10 years ago, I couldn't let that phrase pass away. So I still like to quote him. And it's always the biggest applause line when I, I drop it. Nice. It but it's true. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I, you know, it's like... Um... You can't bundle the how prohibition happened in one package either. It was kind of like this whole, just you know, lack of a better word, you know, between uh, 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 what's the new newspaper guy? Um, yeah, Hearst. Hearst. William Randolph Hearst and uh, uh, the the Mellon Chase banks and the petrochemical industries. All of them saw that uh, their capital intensive processes were going to be devalued with the mechanization of industrial hemp and the invention of uh, the first decorticating machine. And so that's when the first marijuana laws came and they had to call it marijuana. They couldn't call it what everybody knew it was, which was hemp or cannabis. They had to come up with a new racist name. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they used a lot of racist uh, analogies to, to make it illegal. Well, Indian hemp, like what? We're, what the hell's up with that word? Like, yeah, I mean, well, that's from like... India. It was from India initially. Oh, is it? Yeah, and so okay. uh, it was introduced to Western medicine by uh, a doctor uh, uh, from England in the early 1800s, uh, and he called it Indian hemp. Oh, okay, okay, so it came from and India. So that's why you have cannabis indica, and that all indica is also the Latin term for India, and so. Uh, uh, that's where the drug crop was first uh, isolated and bred was in India. Like the land races and whatnot, or yeah, yeah, the the Kushes and the the uh, real strong uh, high THC plants originated there, and those medicines did, and it was commonly used as a drink. They would uh, mm. use milk to uh, extract the the milk fat to extract the the resin and then they would drink that drink they called it bong b h a n g and that's still very popular in in south asia it's crazy how we convinced the whole country like that i always joke that prohibition is the one thing we exported really well out of america you know that fear mongering <laughs> yeah but, yeah it was uh it was actually uh this this guy harry anslinger who had been a alcohol prohibition agent and he's the nephew of uh william chase the head of uh, the chase mellon bank and uh he came up with the whole he called it uh the gore file and he had these uh stories how marijuana caused people to grow crazy and kill their family and friends and chop them up and so he used these pictures uh to uh to give to media all across America in the late thirties, mainly through the Hertz newspapers. And uh, that's how they made it illegal with these lies that uh, this, there was this deadly new drug, like in the movie Reefer Madness. But in fact, it's the oldest crop. It's been cultivated at least 12,000 years and maybe more than 30,000 years. And the most productive crop for protein, the most productive crop for fiber, most productive crop for medicine, most productive crop for fuel. And so uh, that's why they wanted to eliminate it. And uh, that's where that whole phrase, the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, elite, fascist, sons of a bitches comes from. Because mm. that, that lays them all down there in a line there. It's such a funny conversation to have, too, for people who don't really inform themselves on like prohibition or why anything's illegal or why laws are what they are. Cause they'll be like, well, you know, if the government uh, thought it was okay, that would be legal then. Right. It'd be okay. If it did all these wonderful things, uh, you know, we had separate drinking water fountains at one time. I'm just saying, you know, when like, I was born, I was oh my born God, in yes. Texas and until I was six or seven, there were different bathrooms and water fountains for for people who are african-americans man that's so insane when 
you helped because so Jack wrote uh, Emperor's New Clothes in prison, right? He wrote it in jail. Well, he started it when he was in jail in Los Angeles. And so I first saw it in the Yippie newspaper overthrow. It was called the CMI White Paper. And okay. so it was about three pages that Dana Beale had printed without Jack's permission in their uh, monthly newspaper. And so when he came here to Oregon in 1984, he and I both moved to Oregon. And if the story can be told now, our friend John Sajo, who was running the Oregon Marijuana Initiative, was funding it by growing marijuana. So pretty soon, Jack and I were growing marijuana. And uh, uh, he uh, was working on his book. And at that time, cut and paste meant scissors and glue. No one had a computer, you know, uh, and so he had three little kids at the time, uh, River, Cece, and BJ, his three youngest, and they were all under six years old. So you can imagine stacks of cartoons all over your living room are not going to uh, escape a, a three-year-old or a five-year-old. You know, you can't tell them don't bother that. So I live <laughs> about three or four blocks away, and he said, can I come to your house where I was a, a single guy? And uh, put this book together. So he came over with a couple friends, uh, Carolee Wilson and Bryce Garner, and they uh, worked for a few months, uh, took over my house really, and uh, put together wow. the very first edition of it. And it was a campaign literature for our legalization campaign uh, for marijuana. And he and I and John Sajo and a team of hundreds of others, we put the second vote up to legalize marijuana in the United States. In November of 1985, we qualified for the ballot. We turned in our signatures. Oh, wow. That day. And uh, it qualified for a vote in November of 1986. The first vote to legalize marijuana was in California in 1972. And it lost with about 37% of the vote. And, and it was called Prop 19. Ironically, in 2010, the the vote was also called Prop 19 to legalize marriage, which also lost oh, in California okay. yeah. in 2010. But just from pure dumb luck, it had the exact same number. But the first vote was in 72 in California. And then the next year, Oregon became, in 73 became the first state to decriminalize marijuana, where its possession went from being just a from being a felony or uh, to being uh, uh, a ticketable offense. Yeah. And California followed suit in 74. Washington never did until it was legalized. Washington never decriminalized marijuana. No, shit. Yeah. Just yeah, there were about two states that decriminalized marijuana in the 70s, including North Carolina. And uh, then when Ronald Reagan became president, he went to work on turning back the clock and implemented the just say no uh, you know, his wife was famous yeah. for, for spreading that. And so when we made the ballot in November of 85 for the vote a year later, by January, George H.W. Bush, who was uh, the head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy or the first drug czar in the White House, he came and toured the state for two solid weeks, building opposition to our initiative. Oh, wow. And then Nancy Reagan spent three days in Oregon and all the U.S. attorneys from the Western United States. I mean, it was really overkill. And there's more to the story. I could go on and on, but it'll all be in the book someday. Yeah, sure. Well, you've, you've lived a life of watching, you know, uh, uh, I, I joke, uh, well, you know, uh, Steve Elliott. You know, I, I hang out with him one time at his house. And, uh, you know, I, I, I personally don't really view what I do as uh, anything special except for just being a, a citizen, like a private citizen. Uh, you know, I don't make any money. I don't do any of this. You know, I wouldn't mind. But it's not about that. It, there's still a big picture along around all the other stuff. But he's like, yeah, you know, uh, he mentioned that we're documenting history. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I guess it is, you know, in a, in a sense of way. And that's kind of like what, what we did this podcast. We had Keith on here. You know, a lot of guys are getting older, but some of them aren't, you know, uh, as, you know, even myself. I used to have hair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I understand. I so, am. yeah, documentation is huge, and you've seen a lot of it with the uh, um, so one of the that, things doing the show is every week I start out the show and have for over 25 years with hip news, which I've been posting online anyway. 
So I, uh, I, I keep reading all the latest stories. And so I, I keep up to date on the latest developments and news all around the world. And so I have a problem because of that, because not only do I read it, but I compile it and then I read it out loud. I, I makes it a little bit easier to remember. But it's also the truth is what you're speaking. It's, this, yeah. is, this, this is a, you know, when uh, um, I kind of did what you did, but when I got out of the Navy, um, I, I started working down in Tucson. Uh, I supported a uh, Raytheon, you know, big missile company, the danger DOD yeah. stuff. But uh, um, one of the things that really aggravated me was I couldn't find weed. I was like, sweet. I'm out of the military. No more drug testing. Uh, I, I could find cocaine everywhere. It was freaking everywhere in Tucson. But the laws at the time before their medical uh, was like the cartels pushed the weed out of Tucson because that's they got more money out of it, out, out, you know, other States. But, um, uh, but that's one when, when the internet was brand new is when I got a Navy. So you like 90, uh, or 2002 or when the web first started up. Yeah. You know, early, early on when blogs were happening and whatnot and, uh, I, Google. So I decided, so I learned how I used to have, you know, there used to be a thing called Google food and, uh, uh I used to be able to look up the Google news. I would search out all these, I was so adamant when I got out. I was like, why is weed illegal? Why? You know what? Let me let me search for myself and see if like I can find that car crash that killed 100 kids and the planes that came down in the buildings and all the 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 poor neighborhoods all because of weed. And when I did the Google foo looking for these news articles, like you said, all you all that comes out are bust raids. Um, and now you learn about the new cabinoid that wellness people are trying to infuse right. into something, you know, but there's no apocalyptic, Oh shit. We need to get rid of this. You know, no, no place that has uh, legalized marijuana has turned back. That's for sure. And that's not going to happen. I think this year, finally, with the support of Chuck Schumer and the Senate majority leader, uh, we'll see marijuana legalization uh, sometime before the November election. I think the Democrats are hoping it'll motivate young people to get out and vote. And I hope so too. I really do. I really do hope so. I mean, I, I sarcastically said I would have voted for the last guy if he just would have done it like a week before. But, like, again, it's such a big issue to me. Like, the, the time for people are losing behind bars, you don't get that back. You know, your kids get older, your your parents die. There's yeah. so much just well, you like, know, Go ahead. You know, with the, the obvious expansion of artificial intelligence and computers and robots it's pretty clear that in about another 20 or 25 years uh they'll be smarter than people and they could become sentient so as long as marijuana is illegal uh basically uh it's uh uh terrible for the future of freedom for humanity so i look at it as a uh a bellwether issue that oh, with yeah. the the future of freedom kind of hinges for humanity and looking at the really long picture. Well, so we can actually have real priorities and evaluation on like what is crime and what is bad for you. Cause you know, we have legal caffeine and I mean, there's mornings where I don't have coffee and I'm just like, I will give you an HJ for coffee, but I will never for weed. I mean, like it's whatever, you know, I'm just like, uh, it, one has a bigger desire. Whereas one just makes your day better and your life, you know, uh, as a young guy, it was started out with not going to jail. And then, you know, you learn that this plant is a wellness plant. Um, one of the things, like, when I started doing writing online and blogging and, and trying to advocate, uh, when I did find out about the stories, you know, when I did try and search, um, people would reach out to me. And this one guy in particular, I will never forget this. He he showed me a, a video of himself. Uh, he had MS or something, and uh, he was in a wheelchair. And, uh, uh you know, sometimes it's hard to digest that this plant really does help a lot of people, you know, like the cure for cancer, uh, how it does like a, a, a D, uh, uh, congest like in the head, like a, for a brain. Uh, Neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis or uh, seizure disorders like epilepsy and Dravet syndrome and gastrointestinal ailments like GERD and IBS and... Uh, uh, it's just amazing that, and we now we know it is the regulator of all the other neurological uh, uh, cells. So yeah. it runs counter to the the typical flow of uh, 
uh, neurotransmitters and it modulates all of them to create homeostasis. And not just in humans, but in all mammals and many other species as well. And yeah. so uh, uh, it's just uh, kind of a miracle the way it works on so many different things. And then when you look at its history, how it's deeply entwined with the religious practices of all ancient civilizations that we know of, from ancestor worship in China, it's still used in coronating the emperor in Japan, the uh, Japanese emperor, oh. and in Shin all Shinto temples are decorated with him. And of course, there's the South Indian Hindu uh, deities that are closely associated with cannabis like Shiva and Ganesh and Kali and then in the history of Judeo-Christianity it's the holy anointing oil of uh, uh, Judeo-Christian and you know in fact the word Christ means anointed one and so that means anointed with cannabis oil and a highly psychoactive mix at that there is this church in, on the island of Sicily, it's called Monreal. And in Monreal, which was built in, uh, about 900 years ago, uh, they have all of these gold leaf art and painted uh, pictures of biblical events. And there's like 11, more than 1,100 different illustrations in this church. And out of those 1,100, about 20 of them show cannabis and some of the most uh important ones they show eve with the snake and the apple and then they show you know adam coming you know and back then only about less than one percent of the people could read you know oh, so yeah. these pictorial depictions were the only thing they could see and, and understand and then as soon as Adam eats the apple, the marijuana leaf appears and God is there talking to uh, Adam and Eve. And when they show Jesus healing the sick, there's a marijuana leaf depicted there up next to Jesus. And uh, if you wow. look at the Egyptian, uh, they have a bunch of different gods in their pantheon. And one of them is Sushet. And Sushet is the goddess of wisdom and education and writing and she's always depicted with a marijuana leaf over her head you know wow. so it's been involved in spiritual practices going back to prehistoric times you know probably since it was first discovered 25 to 30,000 years ago it's the basis of the founding of agriculture itself and also the domestication of animals the Egyptian, the oldest Western uh, historian is Herodotus, and he wrote how the Scythians in Central Asia used marijuana in, or, you know, cannabis in a tent, and they'd have a, a little tripod with a hanging uh, sensor, and they'd have hot rocks or coals in it, and yeah. they'd put the marijuana on top of it and stay in the tent and uh, inhale the fumes oh, for their God religious practices and you know the Scythians domesticated the horse because they had hemp ropes and the, oh. the horses like hemp and the same can be said we don't have the direct archaeological evidence as well but all the civilizations that domesticated chickens and and goats and uh cows they were all hemp farmers and i think <laughs> the fact that we could grow hemp made them kind of want to come stay with us. We could give them this neat stuff, you know? Well, like you talked about in the beginning there earlier was like, it, it's in mankind and in animals, the endocannabinoid system. You know, I, I joke that society is uh, uh, endocannabinoid deficient because we've denied this part of our like self made it illegal, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, it's like when the sailors found out that scurvy, you know, was caused by lack of vitamin C, you know, what are we doing with the lack of vitamin THC? You know, there's something to be said about that. And I had a question. Did you, um, cause you, you're so familiar with the, uh, uh, the religious side of things. Um, but did you, um, help Jack with his book on religion? I know, uh, Joy Grave sent me a, a copy of that, the PDF, uh, his, uh, Microsoft, uh, what he was starting to write and everything. 
And uh, uh, it's, it's it's interesting. It's incomplete, but it, it was just Did you help him with that at all, or did you see it at all? Yeah, yeah. I saw he, he was – from day one when I first met him, he talked about mushrooms and how the mushrooms were tied into many different religious uh, branches in Judaism. And so he continued to work on that. He never – Never actually put it out, but uh, he uh, followed that, you know, all of his life as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, it just got to be so frustrating. Like, you've been advocating since you were 18. You know, I, I when I was 16 is when I started, like, buying high times and sending donations and stuff. And, yeah. then, you know, that yeah, I started piece... reading, high, reading high times at about that age. And yeah. I read uh, Keith Strop interviews in Playboy when I was probably about 11. Oh my God! Interest in those magazines, and there they were supporting normal. So that's how I found out about it. Oh wow, that's amazing! You know, I, I grew up with the plant, being half Mexican. Uh, my mom had it. Um, my grandmother, my great grandmother, she used to use it on her ointments for oil, oil and stuff. So like, you've been doing this for such a long time, as far as the the law goes. But then you've also been on the business side. You know, with the medical thing, you you started with the with the was it T, was it THCFF? Yeah, uh, I was the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation. I founded that as an Oregon nonprofit in 1990. Wow. And in fact, I don't know if you know, but I went to school in China starting in uh, uh, 1988. And I went to school and I started learning Chinese. I'm a disabled veteran. I tore the cartilage in my knee and ankle. So I got out of the military after less than a year, but with disability status so i used the folk rehab yeah. program to go to school and so uh, i went to school about eight years in college including two of those years in china and uh i started importing i went to school in china because they had the world's largest hemp crop i knew from doing wow. research on jack's book that the china and i'd always had an interest in chinese culture so i went to school in uh Zhengzhou and beijing and uh, looked for hemp products and wow. I found them and started importing hemp paper and fabric in 1990. And I did that as a business up until 97 when uh, I couldn't meet the capital requirements anymore. I spent too much on offices and, and payroll and not enough on inventory. And, you know, and I needed a lot more money and I'd already raised money and I just didn't want to go out and beg for money anymore. Yeah, well, you, I mean, that's business, though. You've learned how, like, like we all learn, like, where we effed up at or whatever. But you also, yeah. but just, you had foresight, I a lot man. <laughs> you put your foresight, though, as far as, like, importing, you know, because, like, now what they say, it's cheaper to, like, make a motorcycle here. You can ship it to China and ship back. I don't know. There's, like, different, you know, shipping. Yeah. And I, when I was in the Navy, uh, we were overseas uh, in Hong Kong, and I noticed, like, different parts of the markets were, like, lots of, uh, uh, expats and whatnot would travel because uh, Hong Kong has, a, or China itself has a lot of these things that are like in bulk and you can buy them and, and sell them over in, in the States. Um, crazy dude. And, but then, yeah, you know, that, oh, China, ahead. now they call the country, their name is the middle country or Zhongguo, but it, you, and they call America the beautiful country or Meiguo, but they used to call their country until the Mongolian and Manchurians took over about 500 years ago for the Ming and Qing dynasties. They called it the the hemp and, and mulberry country. Wow. And that, yeah, because mulberry is what the silkworms ate to make silk, and only the rich could afford to wear that, but almost everyone wore hemp. And oh, so uh, uh, there's a lot of other Chinese stuff I could talk about, but I won't, I won't go into more right now. Well, but there... you mentioned that the endocannabinoid system, I think one of the most important things and perhaps most persuasive in terms of talking to people who think it should stay illegal is that, you know, when women start to lactate or breastfeed their babies, the milk does not flow at first. There's another substance that's called colstrum and colstrum is mostly THC, endogenous THC, which Raphael McCullum named anandamide and that's when the mother transfers her immune system to the baby in this thc and it also makes the baby hungry and want to keep nursing and so uh, i didn't know it was the first portion i just thought it was like a mixture infused with them no. <laughs> oh, and you know wow. that's why when you do a even people who aren't have never used marijuana when they do a urinalysis test for cannabinoids 
they come in at, at, at 15 to 25 uh, percent THC. And that's because they have endogenous THC thereby. And so they don't give you a positive test for marijuana until you get above 25 or 35 nanograms per milliliter in uh, in your urine. And that's because your body naturally produces a THC. Yeah. And again, we don't have a meth system. It's endocannabinoid <laughs> system. It's a meth test. As, as Vivian would <laughs> like to say. Yeah, you know, and it's just so crazy that this plant has it, it's what other thing in our world has to demonstrate itself to be such a non-violent, non-benign, you know what I mean? It's just amazing. It's a blessing. You know, it's a blessing. And yes. another friend of mine who's passed on, John, uh, John Trudell, a very famous Native American activist with the American Indian movement and a poet and songwriter, he says said it's earth medicine. And just like marijuana, cannabis is medicine for our bodies, hemp is medicine for the earth. And we really need to switch to hemp fuels, hemp fiber, and uh, hemp uh, foods to save as much of what's left of our biosphere as we can. Yeah, no, it totally seems, I think, sometimes a disconnect with activism and then mainstream. Uh, you know, and I, I kind of blame the 60s, you know, where the whole like the hippies and then again there's nothing wrong with that it's just now it's people it's stuck in people's minds like you know talking about like shamanism or something like that it's like people are more they they understand that the organic's great and better but they don't also understand like there's that mentality of like yeah it is the earth's medicine it is something natural and given to us as long as we take care of it too right there's a a yin and yang that we got to take care of. But then I think some people get lost in the, um, the spirituality of it. Right. Cause it is all part of a ecosystem that we're all part of, but you know, proving to people like, look, you have it in your system already. That's the part. I think if medically it was taught more, we could cross more boundaries when it comes to like the ignorance out there for cannabis yeah. itself. And you know, like the concept of what is high, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, doctors, they only, you know, four years in medical school, they only take one class on pharmacology. So they don't, uh, they don't really learn pharmacology except from the pharmaceutical companies that want them to sell their drugs after they, they go into practice. Exactly. Did you see dope sick? No, I haven't seen that, but I've heard about it. Oh my God. So it talks about the, uh, the opioid uh, pandemic and and it's all a fake story but pieced together with real facts you know like how the dea found out and how the shackler family was like coerced to fda to like look this is non-addictive which bs you know i mean but it's a very sad thing to see you know the congress is just now considering fentanyl as a schedule like can we just right. reschedule cannabis already <laughs> This healing plant that, you know, can we release the prisoners? It's, it's so great. And then even for you, man, like, so that's the one thing I want to really talk about real quick before uh, you had to go. But to get your story out there, you had a successful business with, with the, the, the the prescriptions or the, the, yeah, the TACF medical clinics helping medical marijuana patients get their state permits. Yeah. And so, uh, and so in 2014, I had a, and I'd had people come to me over the years. I want to invest in your business. And I didn't need investment. Uh, I started it out of, you know, the cable TV studio. And so I didn't really need investment. I always turned them away. And, but in 2014, a group of uh, this guy came who was actually our copier salesperson. And he was, we, we, uh, he serviced our copiers, you know, in terms of, he didn't actually wow. service them, but he was the guy that we talked to in terms of we need a mm. scanner here and a copier there. And we lease various equipment and service contracts. Anyway, he came and said, these people really want to invest in your business up in Canada. Boy. And so I told them that, you know, I won't uh, I don't need any investment. But if you can help us put marijuana legalization on the ballot here in Oregon, then I will I will let you help me take my company public. Okay. And so they sabotaged our political group and then took my signature and put it on other documents. Then when I was out of town, they went into court in a, uh, 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 
preliminary injunction hearing. It was uh, actually an emergency injunction. My lawyer called me and said, no, we don't really want you in. We don't know what they're going to do. Well, the judge gave them my company and my bank accounts before I even got there and uh, using these forgeries. And uh, they, it was clear to me they, they hired the most expensive law firm in Oregon, uh, mm. Mark Woods and Herbald. They represent Nike and they represent Intel oh, and they represent the Democratic Party. So they hired these very expensive lawyers to uh, to go in and present these documents and take over our business. And so I was trying to uh, take the after, I spent one hundred and seventy thousand dollars on lawyers in the first six months fighting them. <sighs> then my lawyer who said he needed initially fifty thousand dollars to get to the preliminary injunction hearing said and i'd already paid him uh seventy thousand he said he needed another hundred thousand dollars because of the the way he was uh the, the amount of documentation he had to respond to oh my god and so uh uh they they in the end they filed thirty five thousand pages of court documents. Holy shit! A lawyer just with ridiculous gobbledygook. For instance, they claimed that you know I had been the sponsor at the Seattle Hemp Fest. Well, they claimed when they got the permission to take over my company that I was no longer the sponsor and that I was taking advantage of their company by saying that I was the sponsor. But you know I wasn't the sponsor anymore. But I had a little placard on at the Seattle Hip Fest that said I was the speaker. And so they tried to say that that said I was the sponsor. Oh, and shit. so the uh, uh, couple of people from the Seattle Hip Fest came down and testified at this preliminary injunction hearing. But the judge pretended they didn't hear any of that. They, uh, they, they When I go into court, judges I'd never seen before acted like they were angry at me. Oh my God. And they, it was clear to me that they bought the court. But still, I knew that no jury was ever going to rule in their favor. So after the first six months, I just defended myself. I would go into court and there'd be three lawyers and two or three paralegals there that I was up against. A couple of the lawyers were making over $1,000 an hour while they were there working on that. And I uh, demanded a jury trial. And so three weeks before the jury trial was scheduled to start, they moved to dismiss their case. Well, I objected to that and said, no, I wanted to go to the jury trial. But the judge said, no, no, their case is dismissed. And wow. so they had taken everything from me. And the only way I can get it back is to sue them in Canada and the United States. But uh, I don't have the resources to do that. Well, they took my company public on the yeah. Toronto Stock Exchange. And at about this time last year, its value spiked up to over 800 million Canadian dollars and over 500 million US dollars. They gave me like $4,000 worth of stock in that. Since then, the value has dropped down to about $100 million, but er, about, uh, they pulled out of medical marijuana. They don't even do medical marijuana anymore. They're doing COVID testing, and they just really wanted to to put me out of business. Really, well, it the wasn't. First, okay. They were first funded by George Soros, and I always thought George mm -hmm. Soros in funding the Drug Policy Alliance was on our side. Well, he was on our side. He and you know, in 2012, when there were three marijuana legalization initiatives on the ballot. There was the one in Washington, which was funded by George Soros's group, the Drug Policy Alliance. And there was one in Colorado, which was funded by the Marijuana Policy Project. But neither one of them really wanted me to be on the ballot in Oregon. And so they came in and just took me out economically and politically. I mean, I'm just talking about the court case, but there were other things oh, yeah. where they attacked well, me. Through, I, even though I was working with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, they uh, brought in the international workers, uh, the IWW, and they filed labor complaints against me. Yeah, yeah. Jesus and so I had to deal with all this crazy stuff. And it was clear that 
you know, no matter what I did or said, the courts were, were weren't going to allow me to prevail. Yeah, you know? it was it was set in stone regardless of what I did. And the only, my only hope was getting it in front of a jury, and they stopped that. I didn't think they could, but they did. But so, like when they when they dropped it, the, the what did you say when they when you brought we were about to bring in a jury and they dismissed the case. You said or yeah, they they dismissed the case that they initially filed. How did they? And they can't. They don't have to give back the bank accounts after that. Like it was dismissed. No, no I have to go in and get a court to order that to happen. And the only way that can happen is if I sue them. Wow, and then. Because they also were trying to make it so you couldn't use your name, too. Yeah, they claimed that that's the one good thing that came out of them dropping their lawsuit is the injunctions against me using my name went away. And so they claim they own my name. They claim they own. I, I grew in my medical marijuana garden, 27 different varieties of cannabis, like train wreck and uh, White Widow and AK-47. They claim they bought that from me. So oh they went God. to other people around the country who were using those names and gave them cease and desist letters because they said they bought it from me, even though they never gave me a penny. <laughs> you know, it's just well, crazy. Even with the false signatures, can you, well, don't you have a means? Like there, there is no repro- – I mean, I, again, I know courts – ridiculous when it comes to that level of money being dropped in. You know, 30,000 yeah. pages is retarded. Is, like who – 35,000 pages. Fuck. Like it's just – you get buried in paperwork, right? This is how like yeah. people bad conducts enabled in courts. Uh, man, that so. And so one of the judge okay. who ruled against me in the preliminary injunction hearing, which was the second injunction hearing after the emergency injunction hearing, that judge, at she was called out. This is really rare by the prosecutor in Multnomah County about six months after, or even less after my injunction hearing. This would have been about 2017. And the prosecutor said that she was corrupt and they weren't going to put any more cases in front of this judge. And so she ret- she didn't run for reelection after that. And now she works for that Markowitz Herbald law firm, you know, uh, the ones that uh, that stole everything from me. What a slap in the nuts, man. Wow. I mean, yeah, like it's unbelievable. Yeah, and then so like, and also this company we're we're talking it's an un-American company. They're Canadian based, but aren't they funded through Empower Israel? Healthcare? Empower Healthcare. Empowered Healthcare. Yeah, Empower Healthcare. They don't and have I Israel, trademark right. that name, but that judge I was talking about a moment ago, she ordered me to give the my trademark registration to them, or I would be fined by the court five hundred dollars a day. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you do against that? I mean, you don't want to pay fucking five hundred dollars. I mean, wow. It's, I couldn't. I could. It's kind of like how, like, in uh, they broke me financially. Oh yeah, totally. They took everything in my life from me. My nonprofit owned a piece of property that we bought on a nine-year contract, and we paid it off and owned it outright. They uh, they took that and oh. they just bought in court for it, even though they never paid a penny for it. That's crazy. You know, and the only reason why I know this is because I saw the ripple effect where you were uh, sponsoring a whole stage at HempFest. Like, I, I know the HempFest talk was like, well, we're going to have one less stage because Paul's going through his bullshit legal stuff. And then when Hempstock stopped, and you know, that's another question about Hempstock because, you know, I think people have this, again, I, I, thought, I said uh, this image of like this euphoric Northwest uh, culture, but it's not because even when Hempstock, you know, like you said here in Hempfest, uh, there was a r- arrest originally, but Hempstock. Yeah, we were always it. fighting the Portland police. Yeah, right up to the end, they would all they always opposed us. I had to go before the city council and override the police denial of our permits. You know. Yeah, I know you had a fight too about them coming through, like continuously walking through, like. Oh yeah, they they, they made us get a lot more security than we ever needed. And they set up little perimeters. So uh, there was a sidewalk in, in the middle of the, the park they said we could go to. They wouldn't let us go to our most successful park anymore. Yeah. But uh, you have to go through security if, when you're going from one side of the Hemp Stock Festival to the other side of the Hemp Stock Festival. It was just uh, crazy. It was yeah, crazy. That was, what was that, six years ago was your last one? Yeah, it was 2016. And so it'll be six years this fall. 
But yeah, like I said, we just got that that outrageous security bill paid off after yeah. all these years, you know, slowly but sure they paid it off because they got judgments against us. And, oh, sure. You know, put just, uh, liens on my partner's properties and stuff. Oh, I just, you know, it just, just shows that, like, even though we have these uh, progressive laws, the area you live in is not progressive, right? People think Portland's this great place. It is a great place, but the cops okay. don't. For cannabis, though, cops aren't cannabis friendly. The politicians still aren't cannabis friendly. You know, and, and, and I mean, they're probably starting to be more now. They're starting to change still, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, they see or, that one. But. Yeah, I think once the federal law changes, we'll start to see even bigger changes. But, you know, there's this irrational fear of THC, and THC has never killed anyone, and they use this THC cudgel to stop industrial hemp from fulfilling its potential you oh, know God, yes and so they go to hemp farmers and they say oh your your farm is you know you could only be less than one third of one percent thc or 0.3 percent and yeah. if it goes to 0.4 percent you've got to destroy your crop and that doesn't work well for most farmers but uh you know it really caused all kinds of farmers to lose their shirt some of them to commit suicide you know, because they uh, they uh, had to destroy their crop or they didn't know exactly how to do it either, you know. Oh, sure. It's their investment that, like, they put all their and hard work. And there was this boom around first CBD, then CBG, you know. Down in Texas, there are a bunch of CBD flower stores, and their mm. flowers look and smell like good THC-rich flowers. No shit. And so they sell... CBD flowers in these stores, and now the Texas police can't uh, tell the difference between the two anymore without testing them. They can't yeah. afford to test them all. I think you're right, though. The whole THC gets a bad rep, and I think part of that bad rep is because of the whole psychoactive word, right? Like, yeah, no one's ever smoked a joint and like, all right, I'm gonna slaughter this house. No, they smoke a joint, I'm gonna kill this pizza. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Gonna take a nap, watch TV. Yeah, it's it's never like oh I feel the urge to go on a sniper shoot. I don't know what the kind of yeah the old the way they started it with the reefer madness myth that it caused people to go crazy and kill their family and friends. Yeah, that's it right there. Like, the Jim Crow laws was another thing they focused on back then. You know, eighty years ago. Do you but, think the because of the prohibition and how it exists, and I and I, I kind of think it is. It's kind of why you got a, a railroaded in court, right? Because it's a weed business. So it's like, hey, here's this guy who started a thing, created a conversation, helped uh, move the conversation forward, which I thank you for with Canvas Common Sense. Like, you've been doing this for a long time besides uh, your, your, your political work and everything else. You know, just generally having guests and talking about it is a thing. And uh, uh, do you think, though, because you are cannabis related is why you were railroaded in court part of that? I think it, it definitely had something to do with it, but I think it was primarily the economics, the fact that, you know, this, this, the, the highest paid lawyers in the state were there in front of judges who really wanted to also be the highest paid lawyers in the state. And so uh, they, uh, and for I think they were taking bribes, if not overt money in their hand, then some kind of quid pro quo was at hand. For instance, in the case of this one judge who uh, uh, the prosecutor said was corrupt, you know, uh, she got this job now uh, making oh, yeah. you know, a th more than a thousand bucks an hour to, to work in this law firm, you know. It's like that lobbyist stuff when someone leaves one thing and then goes on another. Totally, totally, hundred percent. So, what do you? So that's the past. That's all the the, the hard shit you had to go through, and you've been, you know, this I'm still through. helping Oregon and Washington patients uh, on a weekly basis for a few hours. We uh, have them come in and see uh, a, a doctor who's an expert on the endocannabinoid system, and. Uh, and then I, I also am blessed in that I get these free vacations in terms of I go and speak and they pay me to come and they pay my uh, expenses and flights and stuff. So instant, I spent my wife and I spent nine days in Peru in December and uh, nice. in 
October, we spent about a week in Puerto Vallarta. And uh, in uh, September, we were in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina for the Southern Hemp Expo. The fact that I helped import hemp paper and was one of the first people to sell hemp paper and hemp fabric, I kind of helped start the hemp industry. So I'm a speaker about this time next month at the NOCO Hemp Conference, which is the biggest industrial hemp conference in the world in Denver. And so, and I have some other gigs coming up after that in Bogota, Colombia, Ecuador. And next December, I have one in Bangkok, Thailand, which is pretty exciting. It's the second international hemp environmental forum meeting. The first one was in Kyoto, Japan in 2016, just less than a month after the whole corporate takeover thing hit me. Uh, I went and I actually got to share the stage with the prime minister's wife. The prime minister until last year, the longest serving Japanese prime minister, Shinzo Abe, and his wife, Akie Abe, had been advocating for hemp. Like I said, it's tied into Shinto religion and to the coronation of the emperor today. So I got to meet the family that the head of the family that had been growing hemp for the Chinese. I mean, the Japanese emperor's coronation since uh 650 ad for more than 1300 years no shit and, uh i yeah. i i got to meet the first lady of japan it was kind of weird after that seeing her at the table with trump in mar-a-lago <laughs> the white house or anything but uh, <laughs> well you know you, you mentioned japan and 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 i didn't realize any of that but um, yeah most but- people do no, but I also know that Japan is very prohibition heavy. Like I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah people. I, I traveled with cannabis there, and a lot of people were afraid. Japan was the only place I couldn't give away my leftover cannabis oh, as nice. I was leaving because people were too afraid to take it. Yeah, and so I ended up throwing it away at the airport trash can. But uh, uh, what's that disparity though? Is that you know, like, is it because the lower guys are not allowed to have weed, well, and so the uh, well, yeah, it's uh, because General MacArthur made it illegal in 1945. And Akie Abe, the, the first lady of Japan, talked about that at oh, uh, the International Hemp Environmental Forum in Kyoto back in 2016 as well. You know, the Japanese marijuana laws were imposed on them by the American occupation force. And the Japanese are just really conformist in general. It's their culture. Mm-hmm to be conformist and so oh yeah on the island of oahu in hawaii they predominate uh the the culture there and so the island of oahu has 80 percent of the people but it only has 10 percent of the medical marijuana permits where the big island of hawaii has 10 percent of the people and it has 60 percent of the hawaii medical marijuana permits Damn. So it's just uh, because the Japanese culture is so predominant on Oahu, you know, and they're it's, very conformist. Though they are. When uh, um, I was out there, uh, I was on a nuclear carrier, the Lincoln, and uh, they're very pragmatic when it comes to they, they protested us exactly from like 10 to 12, took a lunch break, came back at like 1 to 12, yelled at us in Japanese for a little bit, and then took off. Like that was a protest. Like, all right, cool. But uh, you're right. They're very uh, um for me type you know it's going to be a certain way which is i just again america exported prohibition so crazy out there man. Yeah. hey uh quick question who was in all your years doing the uh, canvas common sense who's been your favorite guests oh you know jack hare definitely was one of the the best he was on a dozen times and he actually gave his last speech at our hemp stock festival so mm. he was on our show on a friday night he gave his speech on a Saturday and he went backstage and he'd had a stroke back in 2000, but it, this was 2009 and he went backstage and had a massive heart attack and never spoke again. But Jack was definitely one. Chris Conrad is another great guest. Uh, uh, there've been so many. I, you said you had Keith Strop on there. He was really good. Yeah. Too. No, he's fun. You know, it's funny too. I don't want to, again, this is like this conversation where, you know, uh you know the reason i always joke like han solo sucked as a smuggler because he was famous right and so like with cannabis you know it's kind of hard to you know i I did my little shady stuff but now i i I had to you know now i I don't know more i don't have to but uh um 
another yeah. good guest, okay. Ben Zonkers. He founded Cincy Seeds in, in oh. Holland. Yeah. And he used that money to find hemp flax in Europe. And he lost a million dollars a year for 20 years until 2016 when he started making money with hemp flax. And now they're the, the largest hemp company in the world. And oh, their hemp is used by BMW and Volkswagen and Mercedes for the interior paneling in those German cars. And their hemp is also used in uh, uh, the Euro note. Uh, oh, the Euro yeah. note is 70% hemp. Most of the world's currency was printed on, and America's currency was printed on uh, this special paper that's 70% hemp or 70% flax and 30% cotton. Wow. And so uh, most of the world's currency still is printed on hemp paper. It's 70, 30 hemp and cotton, but America's is 70% flax and 30% cotton. Even experts have trouble telling the difference between hemp fiber and, and flax fiber. Huh. And the same with the oil, hemp oil and flax seed oil are very, very similar in their nutritional uh, uh uh, profile and their content of essential fatty acids like the omega three sixes and nines. Yeah. So, uh, but Ben Dronkers was another one of my favorite guests. I met him initially at that Japanese International Hemp Environmental Forum, but uh, no shit. He, you know, was in the Amsterdam uh, High Times Cannabis Cup a bunch too. Well, if you know weed, you know Sensi Seeds. I mean, you've seen yeah. their, <laughs> you know, there's, I imagine you can probably name drop for days about uh, uh, cannabis peoples and things. They uh, have the best museum in Amsterdam, and the one in Barcelona is just fantastic. I got invited to a few speaking gigs there in Spain, so I went by the museum, museum in Barcelona. If you ever get a chance to visit it, it's pretty fantastic. And right so on. he's got a few museums. Uh, I mean, I've heard Spanibus. I heard you know Spain. Yeah. I mean, you you've done all these. Uh, you know, I I've been fortunate enough to meet people like you, and and and, and people know who I am. But like, I've never been out of Seattle. <laughs> Fest, yeah. You know, like that's the biggest thing for me. I've done that, and um, you know, oh, I've been well, Hemp Fest period. But like, you know, there's so much stuff that goes on at like a uh, Hash Bash and Spanibus, and I mean, the culture's there, and uh. uh you know, and again, man, one of the more interesting ones, this is something I, I mean, and it's a pretty good story. Yeah. Uh, back in 2015, I was the keynote speaker for the New York City Pot Parade. Uh, and that was the first of the global marijuana parades back then. But Dana Beal is a good friend of mine. When I was there, I hooked up my he called me from in prison. He was in prison at the time for marijuana, of course, one of his many. Most people don't know it, but the first marijuana events like the the Hash Bash and uh, the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest were initially started to get people out of jail, you know. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. anyway, um, so I was the keynote speaker in 2015 at this uh, New York City pot parade this last year uh, in May. The keynote speaker was the majority leader of the United States Senate, Chuck Schumer. <laughs> so oh, wow. uh, he sent out a, a text saying "Happy 420" on uh, that. that day. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a cruel. Like you, you've kind of like come 360, right, or 180? Uh, yeah, because it'd be yeah. back to where you're beginning. I but keep spinning, man, I'm spinning still. <laughs> It's just a weird thing to watch too. Like it's it, it, it's frustrating to see Schumer for me talk about tweet about it. I'm like, finally, Congress is like cool with like not you know they can be openly about it, but still, it's not happening fast enough for me just because people are losing their time, you know, and people are able to to have bad um, bad acts against them just because uh, prejudice in, in in the plant, and it's just yeah. it drives me batty, man. Uh, and they don't know why. They just believe some lie they were told. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> There's a good population of America right now that does that. But uh, um, do you have anything else besides the speaking engagements? Are you doing any uh, um, uh, consulting or anything right now? Not really. Not really. I, uh, you know, I grow a, a much smaller medical marijuana garden than I used to when I owned that property. 
I, I was able to grow and give away over 7,000 pounds of free marijuana to sick and dying people there over a period of about 20 years. But, uh, I have, and I, the speaking engagements in our little clinic, you know, if anybody, you know, needs a medical marijuana permit, then we're, we're still here at THCF medical clinics and they can call us if they want that. And, uh, but I do get invited to go speak at these hemp events because of my background in importing hemp products. I get invited to medical events because I help so many different medical patients and, and, and work with so many different doctors. And then I get invited to, to judge cannabis because I was able to grow and give away so much marijuana. And I won a lot of awards for the quality of the cannabis I grow as well. The Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards and what's the Jefferson Cup. It used to be called the Jefferson Cup in Southern Oregon. Now it's the uh, Southern Oregon Cup. So oh, okay. I just did them in Oregon, though. I didn't I didn't try to enter contests in Washington or California or anywhere else. Yeah. You're more of a local guy than you stay within your region. Is that a... You know, I like traveling. You know, I've helped people in, in nine different states. We had offices. Saw patients like 11 cities across Michigan. So I'm, but I just, uh, I, because of the federal laws, I, I couldn't, uh, I didn't feel right going to, you know, enter my cannabis, oh, God, yes. California can contests or any of these <laughs> other contests. And now I, I get to go judge contests. I just did this one in Peru. I did oh the Copa del Sol and judge that. And most people there said the cannabis I brought was better than the ones that won. But you know, I, I can't, I can't go enter their contest. You know, I, but I'll <laughs> judge it. You know, so you, you I get said, to judge these contests now. Oh, it's kind of you, fun. I did oh, one yeah. in Argentina just before that in November. It's oh, kind okay. of interesting. I spent two and a half days going to oh, the northern Argentinian state of Chaco and its capital Resistencia. I flew into Asuncion, Paraguay. And then I went through a whole thing, the border between the Argentinian border. There was only one place you could enter through. And, but I spent two and a half days getting to Resistencia, and I spent two and a half days coming back. But I was only in Resistencia for two days. But I did get to judge some of their cannabis. Oh. And I've judged cannabis, in very, and I've seen it improve over time in Mexico and Colombia. done a lot of events in Mexico and Colombia. And so... Every year I see improvements in, in the quality of cannabis all over the world. That's what I wanted to ask you about, too, was like, have you found any? I'm, so being half Mexican, I'm highly disappointed in my people. Like, you know, what's a port of you know, wobble? The Mexican Supreme Court actually has the best ruling in the world in saying that marijuana is a human right and part of an individual's right to develop their personality where, uh, uh, they ordered the legislature to legalize marijuana about four years ago. The legislature has failed so far. So about seven months ago, uh, or actually, uh, yeah, last like August of last year, the uh, Mexican Supreme Court just threw out all personal possession laws. And now personal possession is legal in Mexico, oh, yeah. uh, even though they don't they haven't regulated the market yet. Well, when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I joke about like being disappointed, it's just mostly it has to do with because I was in Cabo last year and uh, uh, the weed hasn't changed since when I was 18. Like, you know, there's generations of Mexicans that have been growing weed. I know I had a, 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 a painter friend in Sonola where the uh, crime, you know, the uh, cartels yeah, are alive. Be yeah. And he, he tells me he's driving because he's an artist. He drives down the street and he sees fields of weed, but they're not like. No, none of the all this stuff's been mass produced, drop seeded, and just grow uh, wild. They're not curing it, getting the best out of it. You know, it's it, well, some whatever. people are, some people are, some now. That's usually, that's the cannabis I get to judge in. Yeah, I get to judge in Jalisco and in Mexico City, mm. and uh, uh, so there, are, there's some good weed out there, and it's getting better. Nice. So that's what I wanted to hear. I just wanted to know if there was actually curators of, uh, of the plant, you know, people tailoring. I try, you know, I, I don't speak Spanish. My uh, uh, grandfather uh, was adamant that we're going to be American. And uh, he was an ex-Marine slash uh, grew up very poor in Texas, you know, where they would wash your mouth out. He spoke in Spanish. So um, 
you know, we very acclimated to American, and I wish I spoke more Spanish because I do watch some of these videos. You and the, I don't speak it, Spanish either. I speak no? a little Chinese. I thought you did. I thought I saw you because you go down there a lot. And... No, I can say some words, but I don't really speak the language. I don't understand what's being said. I've been down there a lot. I do yeah. a lot of trips across Latin America, but I, I never studied Spanish. I probably should, but uh, <laughs> sometimes they'll have me say something uh, in Spanish for you know their promotions. But okay, you know I know a few words. I I mean the most important one being baño. I need to know yes. where the baño is. <laughs> you know, it's so uh, yes. Uh, I know some phrases. I get around a little bit, but I don't really speak Spanish. I can understand verbal Chinese. Okay. And, uh, uh, if I study some more, I can read the characters and study even more. I'll be able to write the characters again. Mm. Oh, sure. I mean, it's kind of like riding a bike, right? You have to refresh. And... Yeah, exactly. I haven't studied it in t more than 20 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand a little bit of Spanish, but then I also, because I'm dark skinned, I get imposter syndrome because I don't, I'm not fluent like in English, where, because I do talk a lot fast in English as well. So sometimes people don't, or I mumble. I mean, that's, but I know what I do wrong in English. When I speak in Spanish, it's kind of like I'm trying really hard, but I think I sound like I'm a third grader when I'm speaking. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing about learning a language. You just got to realize you're going to sound like a little kid for quite a while. Yeah. Before you pick it up, like years. You know, just got to jump in and just say it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It, it'll remind you of being a kid when you're doing it, too. You know? Oh, totally. Oh, my God. I, I do feel childlike. When I speak. Right. Oh, shit, man. Hey, I, thank you. You know, we've been on this for an hour and a half almost, and it's been right. such a pleasure. I wanted to, to, to point people out to your, your website. You can go to paulstanford.com. Um, is, is, is this a way to get a hold of you? Uh, best the best way, way is... Uh, just to call our office. It's 503-235-4606. Okay. 503-235-4606. Uh, if you want to see the TV show, we have a little tiny viewership. There it is on Facebook. I mean, on YouTube, but we have more people watch on Facebook. We'll, oh, while we only have oh. like 30 to 70 people watch each week on YouTube, we have... Uh, you know, a thousand or two thousand watching on our Facebook page, and it's facebook.com slash restore him. That's our biggest one. We have about okay. 630,000 followers on that one, and so that's why we stream it there. Oh, definitely. You know, we when I when we post when I post this one, um, it's going to be at to four different channels. We have a, a channel that has 300,000 um uh, subscribers, likes that. All right. uh, you know, I like to, uh, you know, and, and I, I've been doing this just for the jokes, for the laws. I just try and keep people happy, um, you know, give a little funny to the to the world out there. So here's your other page, CRH. Yeah. Oops. Yep. And um, then we have that website, CRH.org. That's uh, another, but the, the Facebook page is our largest social media site. And then also, because on your YouTube channel, you have in your about section, the, the direct link to watch you guys live and your phone number. Which goes to yeah. a U a U stream, which I think is really neat. I didn't know you could I could watch you live. Yeah, you can. You can. I, I need to update the I don't think we're not Ustream went away. We're not on Ustream anymore. Uh, we oh, were okay. on Ustream for a long time. Do you uh, go live on uh, uh YouTube as well then? When you, yeah, when you post you go okay. live on YouTube and you know we're not doing it live now. It's the the interviews and the news are pre recorded, but we we still do our cable tv show at eight o'clock on friday nights so we post it at eight o'clock on friday nights and when we were still doing it live in the studio we would do it live on youtube and uh facebook both but now uh until we go back in the studio again uh the one advantage of course is that because people don't have to be in portland at eight o'clock on friday night we're getting guests all over the world like ben Dronkers who lives in Sabah uh, down in Malaysia or uh, people in Czechoslovakia and Norway and Mexico and uh, Philippines and Australia. They've all been on the show here in the past few weeks because we can just interview them wherever they are at. Hemp really will see the world, won't it? Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Hey, 
Paul, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to click on this little card. I'll do like a little cover letter, and then I'll hit the end, and then uh, we can chat after if you want, too. Okay. But, uh, thank you so much for joining us. You're um, very welcome. Thank you yeah. for having me. Totally, man. Here we go. Let me just uh, do that. Hey, and then.